back there. So I don't know if you guys remember back when we all had DVDs, um, which doesn't seem like that long ago. Like, I feel like I was literally just buying. I, I have bought the DVDs of all the Star Wars movies. Um, so like, if it hasn't, it feels like it hasn't been that long since we all, um, you know, would go to Walmart and spend twenty four ninety five or whatever on, you know, something that now we don't do that with. But uh, remember, you guys, when we had DVDs, how like you would buy a movie and then, you know, a few months later they would put out the movie again, but it would be special, and they would call it the director's cut of the movie, and you'd be like, all right, well now what do I do? Like, do I buy the movie? Do I? Do I do this again? And and what I found was the answer is all like you shouldn't you shouldn't buy that movie because there's a reason why people cut stuff. Like there's a reason why editors exist. There's a reason why like just because there's like a deleted scene, there's a reason why that scene got deleted usually. Um, and so it's usually like the movie's just really terrible. I remember I don't know if you guys remember that movie Alexander with Colin Farrell back in the day, but there was a director's cut of that movie that was really long. Okay, not Lord of the Rings long, but pretty long it was it was like you know a whole thing and like it was hot garbage like i enjoyed that movie and then i watched the director's cut and it added like 40 minutes of nonsense and like i feel like it changed the end even it was a whole thing and it was then it was like 2001 or whatever year that was 2004 i don't know something like that when it was uh i realized that director's cuts are not not always great like just because you add stuff to something doesn't mean it makes it great but as it turns out, I, I bring this up because as it turns out, the whole concept of a director's cut is something that we didn't come up with. Like this idea of you take a story that you know, and then you add stuff to it, and then you think it makes it better. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I mean, look, like I said, the Lord of the Rings thing, I've been told by a lot of people that you know the Lord of the Rings special edition director's cuts are way better than the originals. I've also been told they're like seven and a half hours long each. So I'm not, I'm not doing that. But, uh, you know, maybe... Maybe it makes it better. Maybe it doesn't make it better. But that's nothing new. Like, in, in antiquity, in history, in the church, we have had director's cuts forever. And one of the most fascinating director's cuts uh, brings us to an interesting question. It's an interesting question. Before we talk about the director's cut of the story, we should probably talk about the, the actual story, right? So the original one that you first buy for $24.95 at Walmart, like the first one that you get before the director's cut, right? So the first version of the story is found in the book of John. And it talks about, it is talking about uh, Jesus' death and what happened on the cross. And it specifically talks about the problem with the fact that Jesus was crucified on a Friday, so had Jesus been crucified on a Monday or a Tuesday, uh, a Sunday, you know, like any of these days, it would have been totally fine. But the fact that Jesus was crucified on a Friday uh, created some unique problems for the people who wanted him crucified. Namely, while for the Romans, Friday is just any other day, for Jewish people, the people who demanded that Christ be crucified, Saturday's the Sabbath. Not allowed to do stuff on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to 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 work. You're not allowed to uh, to build stuff. You're not allowed to cook, and you're certainly not allowed to sit and watch a man die hanging from a cross. And so you think, well, what's the problem? Is he just going to die on a Friday? And you you'd think that. But the whole point of crucifixion is that crucifixion is a you know the cruelest possible way to kill somebody. And part of the cruelty of crucifixion is it takes a while. Like, you don't bleed to death from, you know, any wounds. You know, you'd think, like I would think, or, you know, uh, I thought for a long time that, you know, well, you, you drive, a, you know, nails in a guy's wrists, you know, that you're going to bleed out. You know, that's a really easy place to bleed out. You know, feet have a lot of veins and stuff. Um, but the way that they did it made sure that nobody ever bled out. So you would just sort of hang there on the cross, and what you would actually die of is suffocation. Because the longer you hang there the the less you're able to you know be upright and you know the more you hang then your internal organs kind of get condensed and squished and it becomes much harder for the lungs to fill up with air and for you to breathe and so over time over you know hours sometimes even days uh the person who was crucified usually died of um suffocation and that's gross and nobody wants to talk about that but that's that was the reality 
And so the Jewish people realized, okay, it's a Friday. And by the way, it's not just a Friday. It is the Friday of Passover. So they also had like, they had even spe- more, you know, special, holy, devout, uh, you know, worshiping God kind of stuff going on on Saturday also. They realized that like, we just can't be here all night. Like we can't, we can't be here all night. You know, we, we need to get home, um, you know, before, before the Sabbath, we need to be good Jews. I mean, if you're going to murder a man, you know, you got to do it and then go be devout afterwards. So that was their thinking. And so that's, was the problem. So they, so the, the Jewish people went to, to Pilate and they said, look, we understand that sometimes you guys sort of expedite the process. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you guys will make sure that a person dies quicker and the way they did that is you would break a person's legs you just you know hit the guy's legs repeatedly until they shatter and then it you know you it becomes you know it makes it faster because they can't lift up using their legs to take a breath you know they can't fill their lungs you know and so broken legs mean a quicker you know a very quick crucifixion and so that's what they ask for they say hey can you go break jesus's legs and Pilate, as you might recall didn't want to kill jesus in the first place he certainly doesn't want to kill him slowly so he says, um, okay, well, great. Yeah, we'll go, you know, break his legs, do all that, and you know, let's get this over with. I don't want to be here. This whole thing is a sham. So that's what we read happens in the book of John. And this is the end of that story, uh, which we read in John chapter 19. This is how the story ends. It says, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear. And immediately, blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth, so you may also may, so you also may continue to believe. Really tiny little detail in the story of Jesus. You know, really, maybe you forget that it happened. Uh, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but Jesus was dying, and uh, the the soldiers went to go break his legs, and they realized he was already dead, so there's no need to break his legs. And so one guy's like, well, let's make doubly sure. And so he stabs him, and blood and water come out, and that's just that. That's the end of, that's the end of that story. So that is the normal, regular edition of this story. But as funny things start happening over the next uh, thousand years or so, is we start seeing an evolution of the director's cut of this story. And we think it started about 300 years after this story was written, about 300 years after uh, the birth of the church. And you know, we don't know, maybe it happened, maybe it started before that. We just don't, like, we just haven't found anything that has it. But about 300 years after this, or 300 years after the event, these events, um, there's a, there's a book called The Gospel of Nicodemus, which it's not really written by Nicodemus. Nicodemus had been dead for 300 years. But a lot of times back in the day, they would write stories and they would say, oh, it's written by this guy. And it wasn't, but it was just their way of you know, connecting it to their faith tradition. And so these Christians who were uh, you know, devout Christians, followers of Christ, uh, write down kind of the, the story of, Her- of, of, not Herod, we'll get to Herod in a second, of Pilate's life. And as they're talking about Pilate's life, they get to this part of the story And they do something that no one's done that we can find in history before. They give the man who stabbed Jesus a name. His name now in the Gospel of Nicodemus is Longinus. Before, as you noticed in the book of John, he's just a guy, just a soldier who does this. But then now they give him a name. And as it turns out, once you give somebody a name, you give that somebody life. And so it, is, it doesn't take long. It takes another uh, couple of centuries before we start seeing Longinus not just given a name, but Longinus is given a story. And the first story we read r- recorded by the, the ancient Christians of Longinus, the man who stabbed Jesus, is not a good story because, you know, he stabbed Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, you wouldn't think that he's a good guy. But they gave him this name. They gave him this story, right? And the story goes like this. So Longinus stabbed Jesus, and the water and the blood came out. And 
that wasn't good. And so after Jesus raised from the dead and after the church had begun, Longinus, uh, well, he was punished for his role in in crucifying Jesus. And he was punished for his role in stabbing Jesus um, with with a spear, which is, you know, was totally unnecessary. He didn't have to do it. Um, and so there was this letter supposedly written, uh, you know, to Herod, um, and again, explaining, you know, what had happened. It wasn't really written to Herod. It was the whole Jewish thing where they make up things. Um, but the, the, the whole idea is, uh, that this is how Longinus's life goes, that as punishment for what he did, he was cursed to live in a cave with an angry lion, And every day that lion killed him. It ripped him to shreds. It ate him. It did all the stuff. Every night he was ripped apart and and eaten by a lion. And every morning God resurrected him and put his pieces back together so he could go live his life, have his day, and then go back home and get eaten by the lion. This is the curse of Longinus. This is what happens because, you know, God is punishing him for stabbing Jesus. That's a fun story. Not sure what it means or what we're supposed to do with it, but it's part of the director's cut. That's that's where we get. It's our first story. Now, around this same time, around the same time, Longinus is actually not the only character that is being given a backstory. As it turns out, the actual spear he used that you know he stabbed Jesus with, as it turns out, that also becomes famous. We have records within ancient Christian people, ancient you know people between uh, the fifth century, sixth century, and seventh century. Uh, we have all these records of people going and finding that different Christian groups had been passing around this spear and had been you know revering it as you know something that had you know touched Jesus. It had the blood of Jesus on it. Um, by six seventy, this uh, this spear is actually a holy relic of the church and was being kept in Jerusalem. So you not only have Longinus now being cursed, but you now have the Holy Lance, or as I like to call it because it's hilarious, the Spear of Destiny. I didn't make that up. I wish I did. The Spear of Destiny is not a Tenacious D song. It is, in fact, the real name for the spear that everybody loves and thinks is great. Uh, Spear of Destiny is, is now a holy relic for the church. So now time goes on, right? So we have bad Longinus, but we have good spear. And I don't know who it was, but somebody's like, wait a second. If the spear is something we're going to revere, you know, that's a holy thing. Then what? What? why are we being mean to this Longinus guy? We got this lion story. That's not cool. Like we got like the spear is great, but Longinus is not. So here's what happens. By the 10th century, the 900s, we actually no longer see anywhere uh, that lion story anymore. And instead what we see is a story of Longinus that is good and is holy and is righteous. Now, over time, the director's cut, which is ever evolving, the director's cut of this story has now turned Longinus into a good Christian man. I mean, not at first, because at first he's a Roman soldier. But here's how the story ends up going. The story goes like this, that Longinus was a blind Roman soldier. And we should just pause to take that in for a second. I just love the idea that no one was like, we got to rewrite that. Because they're not blind Roman soldiers. That doesn't make any sense. Or maybe they did, but then, like, that guy got, like, voted down. Like somebody was like, hey guys, like we gotta write something different. And they're like, no, 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 we love the blind thing. We're going, we're going with the blind thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to make sense. It's fine. So blind Roman soldier, and he stabs Jesus in the side because he's got really good aim for a blind man. And you know, he does I don't know if it was the first try, like the first one he just missed and like stabbed the cross. That's not very nice of me. But he stabs Jesus. The blind man stabs Jesus, and the water and the blood comes out. And as the water and the blood flows out, some blood splashes and gets in Longinus' eye, which is gross, but also creates a miracle. I mean, it's a hazard and like a medical hazard now. Like we go, you know, we don't want that in like hospitals now, but here it's fine. So his, his eyes are, it's a miracle. The blood of Jesus... Uh, restores his sight. Longinus realizes this is the son of God. 
we have killed the son of God and he quits the army, which the Romans also don't let you do, but he quits the army and he, and he goes and he lives a life as a monk. And then he, in, in time, he does monk stuff and usually doing monk stuff ends, ends up with you getting martyred and it happens that he's a martyr. That's cool, right? By the, by the 10th century, that's, that's the story. That's, that's it. The epilogue to all this is somewhat crazy, okay? Despite the dubious history in all of this, despite the fact that this is very obviously just being made up as it goes along and evolving over time, the Catholics, the Anglicans, the Orthodox, the Coptics, and the Orientals have all decided that they are going to make him a saint. So he is Saint Longinus to those five Christian groups, um, which is just fantastic. I, I think it's great. I mean, they, they have to know that like it's a made up story, but they it's such a good story, it's such a fun story, it's such an interesting story that they just went with it anyway. The Catholic Church still has the Spear of Destiny. It's in Rome. Like you can't see it because they have all sorts of stuff you can't see. But like if you were Nicolas Cage in a movie, you know, Maybe you go after the Spear of Destiny, you know, because you got to have it. Now, I tell you guys all this, and I'm, I'm making fun a little bit because, man, it feels like we have to because it's so absurd, but also fun. I tell you guys this story not to tell you not to believe this stuff and not to make fun of anybody. I'm not really, I'm really, I'm really not trying to do that. Um, but I tell you this story, just kind of ask a question, okay? So, like... There weren't director's cuts of all the movies, right? Like, there's no director's cut of movies that nobody cared about. That's, I mean, that's sort of a, even back when we were all buying DVDs, you, you didn't just didn't have, like, one of everything. It was, like, the, it was either the good ones, the popular ones, the ones that seemed, uh, you know, society deemed were, you know, worthy enough that we would all buy it, right? There's a question. That original story of, of Jesus being stabbed and the water and the blood comes out, why is that deemed worthy of a thousand years of writing stories about it? Why? Like, if I'm an ancient person and I'm going to make up stories and I'm going to say, like, oh, we're going to give the guy a name and he's bad now. And then, well, now he's good. And now he's a saint. And also, like, the spear of destiny. And here's his, you know, here's this whole thing. Like, okay, like, cool. But why that story? There's so many stories in the Bible. Like, there's so many stories in the Bible, guys. Why is that a story that was deemed important enough to them to, you know, have all of this? I think the answer to that is not very helpful, but it's the answer. And it's just going to beg it. We're just kicking the question down the road. But the answer is actually, if you look closely, John sees this story as incredibly important also. Let's, Eric, put that back up there. Put that verse back up there. Let's read that verse again. And I, I, and I went over it quickly before, but this is what it says. It says, the soldiers came, broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. Okay, cool. But look at this next sentence. It's in parentheses because that's what, that's what this translation does. The Greek doesn't have parentheses. This is just there. This is a really interesting sentence. It says, this report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. That's, now, that's a John special. John likes talking about himself in the third person. This is the guy who says, well, the disciple Jesus loved. And he's talking about himself. Like, John is pretty third person-y. So when he says there is a, uh, an eyewitness account here, he's talking about himself. And he says about this story, I was there. That's really what happened. And I need you to believe it. I don't remember. It's possible I'm getting, you know, there's something I'm missing here, but... I'm like 97% sure that John never does that for any other story. Which is weird. Like John saw the feeding of the 5,000. That's a big deal, right? John saw water turn to wine. That's a, that's a big deal. John saw blind men healed, you know, who'd been born, you know, born blind. That, that's, that's a big deal. 
John saw Lazarus dead and then brought back to life. That was such a big deal that that's directly the reason that, Je that Jesus got killed. That's the miracle that the Pharisees say, like, we believe that Jesus is doing miracles. This is, uh, we have to kill him now because people will follow him. Like, if people hear this happen, then they're all going to believe in him too. And to none of those, in anything, anywhere else did John say, I mean, like, look at what John's saying. John is saying, guys, no, really, it happened, and you should believe it. <laughs> Nowhere else is John saying, no, really, it happened, and you should believe it. Nowhere else does he say that. Super, super fascinating. Super fascinating. You see, as it turns out, it's not the people for a thousand years who are setting this story apart. As Jesus gets stabbed in the side and water and blood comes out. Like, the people who came up with Longinus and the story with the lion and the story with, you know, the blind and the blood and the martyr and the saints and, and the, 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 the spear of destiny, like, none of that at all, none of that is, is, is unique. They're just doing what John did. John sets this story apart. He points it out and he says, hey, everyone, you need to pay attention. And you see, it's, it's not just here that John does that. So John also writes some letters. And in the first of those letters, he says this about Jesus and the water and the blood. This is what he says. He says, who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, but the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. John is really... I mean, think about what he's saying here. He's saying, so we have testimony that Jesus is, in fact, God's son. And you would think, okay, well, the Holy Spirit testifies that Jesus is God's son. Well, of course he does. That makes sense. But he says there's, there's two others that are along with the Spirit who equally testify with God's Spirit, and it's water and blood. And that's the reason we should believe that Jesus is God's son. And not only is that the reason that we should believe that God's son, but then because of that, that is the reason why we conquer the world. We have victory over the world. We overcome the world. There's lots of different translations of that word. But we win. The reason that our faith wins is the water and the blood. John, <laughs> it's weird. It's this weird thing. Why is it so important? I think answering that, we're going to have to do a little bit of a roundabout way to, of answering that. But to answer that, we need to think a little bit allegorically. We think a little bit symbolically, a little bit theologically of what's going on here. And I know that's hard for us. Man, modern Christians, especially here in America, we modern American Christians, we get so hung up. We get so hung up on whether something's literal or not, and then we decide something's literal, and then we spend endless time defending. I, like I, when I was in high school, I still remember there was a sermon that was preached by somebody. I, I was probably at like a youth event or something, and they talked about this passage. And I don't know like why they harped on it so much, but this guy spent like twenty minutes talking about medical terminology of the actual medical thing where water and blood can come out of a dying person. And I remember getting like 10 minutes into this and being like, I don't know why I'm supposed to care about this. Like, even if it's true, like I know, I have no, you know, problem believing that this is a thing that happened. My question is, what's it matter? We just get so hung up. So let's just say this. It, it happened. There we go. Now let's, let's talk about what it means. And to understand exactly what it means, we need to understand why Christians are the way that they are. And if I say, why are Christians the way that they are? Man, that, that's a question. The last time I talked about, you know, Christians in, in this kind of a context, 
I mentioned that there were like 40,000 denominations. That was a couple years ago, so we probably added a few thousand. Though with COVID, maybe you've slowed up, so like maybe it's just 1,000. I don't know. But we just, we, they're like, to say somebody's a Christian doesn't really give you a lot of information, right? Like, if I say like, oh yeah, Hank, Hank's a Christian, like, I mean, so like there's, I mean, there's all sorts of Christians, right? Like, there's Christians who, who handle snakes and get bit by snakes and then go to the hospital and die. And then have to explain why they got bit. It's a whole, see, that wasn't nice of me. But there's the Christians that handle snakes. And then there's Christians that, you know, make fun of Christians who handle snakes, apparently. Uh, there's Christians who go door to door. And there's Christians for whom that gives them a panic attack to even consider it. You know, there's Christians who pray to saints. Uh, there's Christians who think praying to saints is heresy. There's Christians who think that, like, everyone's going to hell. There's Christians who think no one is going to hell. Uh, there's Christians who don't think there's a hell to go to. There's Christians who think there's a hell, but it's temporary. A lot of beliefs about hell. I mean, there's Christians that, like, you know, they, they, they chant, and there's Christians who speak in tongues, and there's, you know, there's just... Again, there's just so many kinds of Christians. There's so many kinds of Christians that I mentioned a holy relic, and none of you guys were like, what's that? Like, we don't have holy relics, but they do, and we completely accept that, like, they have things called holy relics, and we don't, and okay, whatever. That's, it is what it is. You know, like, I, you know, I talked about, like, the Gospel of Nicodemus, a book that we don't look at. <laughs> and none of you guys said, well, why is he talking about that? Like, no, you know why I'm talking about that. You know there's these other books. Like, you know that that's, like, we are we are so well versed with like the diversity of the church that I can just rattle off five different large giant Christian bodies and chances are good like you guys hadn't even heard of a couple of them and you're you you accept it it's fine like it's fine because we just know there's a lot there is so very little that unites Christians and yet like, I'm sure you can find the exception to this, but almost without exception, the one thing or the two things that we Christians all do is we all baptize and we all observe communion. Now, look, we do it differently. You know, you baptize babies, you baptize adults, or you baptize for different reasons, and you know, you baptize, you know, or, you know, the, you know, with sprinkling or you know, full immersion, or you know, there's communion. Like some churches are, you know, like if it's not wine, it's not communion, and some churches like ours, like we've got grape juice, and some people think that like Jesus t shows up and then you know, he's, he's the literal body of Jesus, and some people think it's, you know, I mean, look, I don't know, there's all sorts of different explanations and things. But we all baptize, and we all observe communion, which is a fancy way of saying we all religiously do things around water and blood. The meaning of, of baptism is, is wrapped up in water. The meaning of communion is wrapped up in the blood of Christ. Water and blood. The reason that John is so focused on water and blood in his gospel, the reason why he's so focused on water and blood in his letter, the reason that for a thousand years the church is so focused on Longinus and the story of water and blood is the same reason why 40,000 denominations cannot decide which way is up or if the sky is blue, and yet we all baptize. And we all focus on communion. This morning, we're beginning a new series called Water and Blood. We're going to answer exactly why this is so significant for the next five weeks. We're going to talk about why is baptism so significant beyond just I got baptized and, you know, now I'm a Christian or, you know, whatever it is. Or I got baptized and now I'm just part of this whole thing. Like, what is it that, that like, why is baptism it? Why is that the thing we all do? We're going to talk about that. And we're talking about communion. Why is communion the thing we all do? Like, it, you beyond just, you know, it's the snack time in the middle of the service. Like, 
what is, you know, why do we do this? Why does everyone do this? Why have we, why have denominations blown up about like, you know, well, can the priest do it? Or like, why is communion so important? We're going to talk about that. And we're going to get pretty specific uh, about each one. But to answer this question about why the water and blood, why John is so focused on it, why they're so focused on it, why we are so focused on it, to answer that, we need to look, before we get specific, let's get a big picture view, okay? So what we're going to do, this lesson, this this lesson at the end of week one, this is sort of going to lay out kind of a, an outline blueprint preview of everything we're going to talk about. Kind of in one sentence is the whole sermon series. So if you don't show up for the next four weeks, it was just this sentence fleshed out. Four weeks. Don't not show up for four weeks. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying like this, is, that's what we're doing. And to get that, we've talked a lot about John. Let's get away from John for a second, and let's talk about uh, Paul. So here's what I love about Paul. I mean, there's a lot that I love about Paul. But one of the things I love about Paul is just how blunt he is. Like, it doesn't always come across in the English translations. Like, we sometimes try to make it flowery. And that was, that was King James's fault. Well, not him. He didn't do it. But, like, the people that he hired to do it. It, it got his name on it, but he's not the guy who did it. I don't, are we all aware of that? Well, if you learned that, King James didn't actually translate the Bible. He hired some guys to do it. I mean, maybe nobody was confused, but I'm the guy who said King James did this. So, But, like, that's a very flowery, very, very, um, I don't know, like, high church sort of. Uh, everything's very important. And we, we sometimes miss the bluntness. Like, Paul is just a guy who's writing bluntly. And in the book of 1 Corinthians, which is actually a letter to the church in Corinth, Paul is extremely blunt about the situation um, as it pertains to the cross, as it pertains to the meaning of the cross. Paul flat says, look, guys, understand. The cross is hard. And the people he was talking about, too, in Corinth, the, the, you know, the way that the, the Corinthian church begins is, you know, he goes and he's trying to talk to Jewish people, and the Jewish people, they're not having any of it, and it really upsets Paul. And they upset him to a point that other Jewish people haven't upset, upset him. And so he finally just says, forget it, guys. I'm going to go and just talk to the, uh, the Gentiles, and we're just going to make this a whole Gentile church. So he's talking to Gentile people uh, who are brand new to Christianity. They're brand new to what's going on. Um, but he, he sort of makes it specific. He says, look, it's, it's not just you guys, you Gentiles. It's everybody. This cross thing is tough. And what Paul says is the cross is uh, offensive to the Jews, it's blasphemous, it's heretical, it goes against their, their uh, religious values for God to become a person, it goes against for their, their religious values for God uh, to die that sort of a death, you know, to die at all, but then to specifically die that sort of death. And he says, look, I, uh, the Jews are going to be offended by this. The Jews are offended by this. I've been talking to the Jews. They are very offended. Uh, this is scandalous to them. <laughs> but he says to you, you Gentiles, this is a whole Gentile church. He says, look, y'all just think this is nonsense, don't you? Like, you just think this is foolishness. To you, the cross is foolish, and I get it. Because you see, the way that, like, kings work is they don't get killed on crosses. You know, the way important people are, it they don't die at the hands of the state. Like, Usually, if you're going to win, you avoid getting killed. And Paul just tells him, look, I get it. I, I know this is hard for you. I know, like, you accepted this. You became Christians. You're part of this church. But I also know you're struggling. You are struggling with the meaning of the cross. And he goes on to explain in kind of a roundabout way that it, 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 it's turning everything upside down, Right? That, 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 that what the cross is doing is it's God sort of critiquing the way the world works. Look, the, if the world worked the way it was supposed to, God never needs to become a man. Jesus never needs to show up and show us how things are supposed to work. Jesus never has to die. If the way the world operates worked, there is no need for God. But if there is a need for God, if there is a need for Jesus, if there is a need for the cross, then it makes absolutely no sense for that to play out in the way that the world works. So like these Gentile people, these Christians would expect that God would save the world through a way that other people in the world would save the world, right? But Paul's whole point is, 
if other people could save the world, there'd be no point for Jesus. There'd be no reason. Jesus comes and does it a different way because by definition, he has to because the world doesn't work. And then he says this. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 30, this is what goes on on the cross. This is the point of the water and the blood. It says, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. That looks like a weird passage to talk about the cross, and it looks like a weird passage to talk about baptism, communion, and water and blood, because none of those words were used. The Bible's fun like that sometimes. Paul is talking about the cross, though. This is the end of his conversation about the cross. And as it turns out, that passage right there explains everything we need to understand about what God is doing and why the water and the blood and the cross are so important. Because at the end of the day, the two things that are here, Jesus as wisdom, the two things that happen here, the two promises were given, those are things, those are promises that are made that mirror the promises of baptism and communion. The first one is unity with Christ. We are united with Christ. We are one with Christ. That, as it turns out, is the quickest, easiest, simplest explanation of what baptism is. In baptism, we unite ourselves to Christ. We choose to be united by God to Christ. That's baptism. Jesus lived. He died. He was buried. He raised from the dead. In baptism, it's symbolically us living, dying, being buried, being raised from the dead. Baptism unites us to Christ. So that's the first thing. Second thing is communion, is the forgiveness of sin. With the cross, our sins are forgiven, which makes sense because Jesus, when he had the Lord's Supper, the very first communion, said, this is my body and blood given for you for the forgiveness of sin. <laughs> That's the point. We are not just united with Christ, but we are now made holy. We are made righteous. We don't get it right, but we are made righteous. In communion, symbolically, week after week after week after week after week, every single time we take it, we remember symbolically that we are righteous. Even though we're not righteous, that we are righteous. Because of Christ's body and blood. What he did on the cross. The point of the cross is for us to be united with Christ and forgiven of sin. That is the promise, is that we are united with Christ. We are forgiven of sin. And in baptism, the water, we find symbolically that we are united with Christ. In communion, we find that symbolically we are reminded of being forgiven of sin. These symbols represent the reality that we are united with Christ. We are forgiven of sin. And they're visible, tangible symbols to help us remember Every single day. Man, that's cool. <laughs> but you see, here's where we get all of this. Here's where we connect all of it together. Okay? Here's where we put all of it together. Even though we are united with Christ, and even though we are forgiven of sin, it is still in no way, shape, or form ever about us. You see, God made Christ to be wisdom itself. He didn't make us. He didn't make the church to be wisdom itself. He didn't make you or me to make uh, be wisdom itself. He didn't make Paul wisdom itself. He made Jesus wisdom itself. Which is why at the end it says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. What that means is, is that all of this is Christ's work. Which is another fancy way of saying baptism is Christ's work. Communion is Christ's work. And if we ever wonder, is this Christ's work or is this our work? Or, you know, if we, are we getting it right? Are we not doing it? If we ever wonder what's going on? Well, here's a story about this guy named Longinus. And he wasn't going to break, they didn't break Jesus' legs because he was already dead. 
But when they stabbed him, there was water and there was blood there. The water and the blood on the cross comes from Christ. The water and the blood in our lives comes from Christ. The water and the blood and all of its rich, deep, symbolic meaning comes from Christ. If you hear nothing else over the next month, please hear this. We get baptized because of the work of Christ. We take communion because of the work of Christ. If anybody wants to boast, let him or her boast in Christ. He is wisdom, and all of this is his gift to us. And when we understand baptism and we understand communion, when we understand all of this, what we understand is that all of life is a gift of Christ. There is no part of our lives that is not a gift of Christ. And I'd say it's worth 40,000 denominations all baptizing people and 40,000 denominations all taking communion. I'd say for us at Ashland Christian Church, for us to take communion every week, I'd say, and I'd say for every single person to say, look, if you haven't been baptized, that, it's, it's open to everybody. Like that, there, there's a reason for this because it is the work of Christ. And it's not just the work of Christ, like when we get baptized or when we take communion. These things point to the realities of every single second of our lives. This morning, we're in our first week of our series called The Water and the Blood. As we begin this series, we're going to get more specific. We're going to get more stories. We're going to get, I mean, I mean, this is, this is everywhere in the scriptures. As we get through, if we start all of this, this incredible stuff. We need to lay a foundation of what all of this means. Big picture. This is what we're talking about with The Water and the Blood. Our first lesson from Longinus and John and the director's cut and Paul is this. Baptism and communion are gifts from Christ, as his water and blood given on the cross gift us forgiveness and unity with him. Baptism and communion are gifts from Christ, as his water and blood given on the cross gift us forgiveness and unity with him. So when the musicians come forward, we're going to sing a song. We offer the invitation each and every week. This is the baptism part. It's going to be weird. This is now I'm talking about baptism for a couple of these weeks. Uh, the structure here is like this is the introduction, and we got two weeks with communion and two weeks with baptism and connecting all together. But uh, so now I was like, well, I just talked about baptism, so I, now I'm going to do it again, but I don't need to. So just remember what I just said like two minutes ago. Offer an invitation for baptism, <laughs> repentance of baptism. If you've ever made a decision, nice morning, baptistry, let's talk. If you're an immersed believer in Christ, you're looking for a perfect church on this place is not it. But we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect, we want to call, we want to cultivate, we want to meet new people, we want to share the gospel, we want to grow up while we do it. And we want to be people who understand that we are united with Christ. We want to be people who understand that we are forgiven people. And we want to be people who understand that those are and always will be and always have been gifts of Christ because he is the one with the water and the blood on the cross. As we stand...